And to finish today's proceedings, we're going to talk about where we go from here in our understanding of how the brain works. I'd like to welcome our final speaker, Evian Gordon. focusing or sharing with you some of the exposures we've had as an international consortium to look at the no, the train and optimise. And clearly the optimism training that's been so elegantly outlined by Martin Seligman in terms of happiness and meaning, relationships and skill enhancement it's important because our brains essentially have this huge bias to negativity for survival reasons. So we need to be attuned to that reality to be able to transcend it. Moreover, there is a conflict often between our non-conscious biases and drives, and our conscious behaviours, however well intentioned they might be. So there's no easy way to know, train, or optimise yourself. I'm just going to end off with a snapshot of some of the possibilities that have been addressed and that seem to be emerging. The important thing about knowing the brain, however you get to know it, in this particular case, minimising danger, maximising reward. There seem to be four key processes, emotion, thinking, feeling, and how we regulate them, that particularly impact on our behaviour. The automatic emotion, rapid processing of what we find threatening or rewarding, are the most deeply ingrained, and in some senses the hardest to modify. Whereas facts, thinking, or controlling our Feedback of our heart rate, sweat rate through mindfulness meditation, for example, seem to be more tractable. But because the brain is so highly interconnected, we can utilise that reality to train one and benefit all. But there's some virtues in assessing your brain so that you see what are your strengths, what are your personal limitations. But it's more than just understanding your level of anxiety. It's literally like a cardiac stress test. How do you recognise emotions? What is the capacity of your memory and your ability to put these pieces together? What is your brain profile when you add your emotion, your thinking, your feeling, and how well you regulate them? What brain profile type would you be? Because that basis, that fulcrum allows you to then be the expert on you. There are no gurus. No one has a monopoly of wisdom in the face of this complexity other than yourselves. So the way forward to do that is not trivial and there are scientists who are trying to bring all the information together and well acknowledge one particular consortium that's doing that. How do we optimise? How do we align our emotion, thinking, feeling and self-regulation? And how do we move beyond this ambivalence between, that sometimes occurs between our conscious and non-conscious brains of the fear of failure, a whiff of a fear of failure in the brain that will self-sabotage, it will find some reason not to change. But even if you do want to change, how well strategically do you have a plan, measurable, monitorable, that's realistic? How many of these elements are you actually doing rather than talking about? And how well delineated are your goals? How smart are they in terms of the realism that's been shown to be critical to genuinely effect change? And it's the small things 
in this highly interconnected system that seem to matter most. Daily, small steps where your brain gets that dopamine hit and avoids that failure seems to be the critical momentum builder towards a cycle of success. One of the most extraordinary things to me looking at this international database that we're involved in is how narrow the gap is between a cycle of success and a cycle of decline. It seems to me to be incredibly simple at some level how positive validation and reinforcement, tiny steps, can lead to dramatic changes and vice versa. And as much as I'd love to be optimistic and warm and fuzzy about the brain plasticity revolution, it is real. You can change your brain. But it is not, I think, as easy as people think. And there's a litany of failures of programs around the world that bear testimony to that. And I, I have a rule, I call it the thousand times rule, that once you have delineated a clear goal, doing it enough times for it to become an automatic habit is the crucial the perseverance to do that is the crucial bit. And a thousand times can be, part of it as we've seen in the conference, can be visualising it as much as actually doing it can have a similar impact. Similarly, we're seeing in the corporate sector, people who train self-regulation have quite significant benefits in, in, in productivity. This is very large American companies that we're working with. But it takes very little of sustained training to show quite significant benefit. Clearly we're all familiar with memory training and there's a myriad of ways to do that. Daily problem solving, memory training is one that just takes a small amount daily to make a huge impact and difference. Similarly with feeling training, just focusing on the positive feelings. This happens to be one downloadable from iPhones. So you just touch the happy feelings and ignore the unhappy ones. Simple. But it changes your mindset in a subtle but unambiguous manner. Surprisingly. And of course emotion training. This is not something that's going to happen just by talking about it. One needs to train. What are the key cues of detecting the crow's feet, the, the corner of the mouth when somebody smiles, that's authentic, versus just smiling at your mouth, which is inauthentic. These can be trained, the equivalent of micro-expressions, that really make a difference in terms of perceiving. And then aligning, seeing how well you can actually use these brain insights. It's about, for example, in relationships, to quote, one of the great behavioural change experts in the world, Dr. Eugene Baker, the more you truly understand how someone else sees the world, the more compassion and value you'll have for them in terms of relationships. There's no superficial way to do this, but the insights are likely to be beneficial. And the same for one's personal sense of genuine choice and authentic self based on this insight of yourself and training. So to conclude, to quote one of the most thoughtful philosophers, psychiatrists in the world, David Whitehouse, a Harvard psychiatrist, people not only seek an empowering mind, but one that is at peace with itself. Brain and mind is the only common factor amongst humans that we share across cultures, religions and nations. I hope that brain development does and deserves to become a human right. Thank you very much.